Okay, welcome to episode 109 of the Plant Cutting Podcast. And on today's episode, we have the pleasure of interviewing one of my permaculture heroes, Eric Tonsmeyer, about his new book on trees with edible leaves, which is free on the internet. I'm sure you're going to love this episode, but before we get into it, I have a very exciting announcement to make. So this summer, September 9th through 10th, 2023, we will be having a live, in-person, plant cutting conference at our farm in central New York. And we've got Matthew Wood as our keynote, some amazing speakers including Kate Gilday of Woodland Essence, Lisa Fazio, who we interviewed on Italian folk magic and medicine, Zamboni Funk, and many more. So save the date, September 9th through 10th, and email us at info at plantcutting.com to get put on the email list where you will be notified of future updates. The tickets will be coming soon, but for now, just save the date and stay tuned. So today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we have Eric Tonsmeyer, and I first learned about Eric from the Edible Forest Gardens book, which he did the plant lists for, and those were phenomenal, and I've been following Eric's work since then, and he put out a new book recently, and it's free online about trees with edible leaves. And this is a fantastic topic. I'm very excited about this. But before we get into that, Eric, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk about trees with edible leaves. And we've just moved to, my son and I have just moved to a a new farm about 10 minutes from our former garden where I'd lived for 17 years. So we're starting fresh on a new big piece of land. Well, big for us, 50 Mm. times more land than we had before. So that's wow. Yeah. That's exciting. That's really exciting. A lot of work though. That's the thing about the permaculture stuff is like, it takes so long mm-hmm. to get it established, but it's, mm-hmm. it's so fun too. We're in the, we're in the, the hard work stage over here for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We just got our place three years ago and this is our fourth season and it's, you know, it takes, takes a while to get the stuff going, especially in the cold climates. Yeah. Things go <laughs> slow here compared to other places. It's always very sad to go somewhere warm and see how fast things grow. But then they have, you know, fire ants and poison snakes and True. nematodes and monkeys that eat your fruit and fruit <laughs> and all these other things that we don't we don't have. So year round pests, which we don't have. So I try and remind myself. But yeah, it's hard, it's hard to remember that in February. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Eric's in yeah. Massachusetts with us up here in the Northeast. Plenty, mm-hmm. plenty cold enough. Yeah. 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 So you live in Massachusetts, but I've also seen that you do you do work in Mexico too? Yeah, I, I have worked closely over the years with a project in, in Veracruz in the cloud forest, which is a really, really lovely, great project called Las Cañadas. Wonderful folks and really amazing climate and incredible world-class plant collection and demonstrations and stuff. Just really And they have no building codes and they have, you know, a number of other advantages. They they can make all the composting toilets that they want. So they have certain advantages as well as disadvantages from being in Mexico. So it's lovely. They can just go ahead and build all the buildings they want out of bamboo and not worry about anybody giving them a hard time about it. So that's That's cool. You can just go for it. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Not necessarily do that in Massachusetts. Mm, No, no. So, Eric, we have a traditional first question on the show, and it's how did you come to the plant path? Oh, sure. Well, let's see. So I had been sort of an environmentalist type or whatever, I guess, in high school. And after high school, I went to work at a nature center in my neighborhood. And I found out about permaculture while I was there. They took me to some conference. I found out about permaculture. I went back to the library, read Permaculture One, which was all that I could find at the time. And, and the idea of was really plants as parts of an ecosystem, a productive ecosystem that would produce food that you could engage with and interact with and design was really what got me. And then the question was, well, what plants, what plants will grow where I live? Right. Yep. Uh, so I spent a long time fleshing that out. And then eventually that sort of became, well, what are all of the world's useful perennial plants? Because... That's sort of a compulsion that I can't stop at this point. (laughs) A compulsion. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't claim that it's all, you know. 
Not all, all, all non addictive. Truth. I think yeah. some of it is addictive, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I definitely see that in myself. There's like a uh, avaricious, I don't know, like acquisitive, you know, collective, you know, you like to collect mm -hmm. stuff. Big time. I cannot disagree. Yeah. <laughs> As it gets obsessed with certain things, he goes through seasons. Last year, there was like a blueberry obsession where he yeah. had to get like 50 different varieties of blueberries and we're like all right don't stop keep going and when they're Everyone. perennial they just keep going i did a year on spices mm -hmm. cold hearty oh, yeah. spices. cool nice. and all different things and now now again we're starting over here but it's a lot of it's yeah it has not gotten boring yet after mm -hmm. 30 some 33 years or something totally yeah, there's so many, so many plants. I keep learning new ones. Mm -hmm. I learned a new one from your book, Tuna, which is a edible leaf tree, which apparently might be able to grow up up here. So I'm excited about trying that out. So would you like to tell us a little bit about your book and why you sure. wrote it? Yeah. So why Trees with Edible Leaves? Sure. Okay. Well, so I first kind of came across some of these plants when I was working on Edible Forest Gardens and the Perennial Vegetables book. And the idea that you could eat the leaves of trees was so foreign to me as a person from the United States that's not part of what we do mostly. It seemed like something out of Dr. Seuss or something to me. It was hard to even understand. So I've had an interest in these plants since then. That would have been maybe around like 1997 or something. I first tasted a tree with edible leaves in 1997. It was a salt bush, a tree purslane in England. Hmm. It was a very memorable experience. And I worked for a couple of years and published in 2020 an analysis of the world's perennial vegetables, which included their nutritional value compared to annual vegetables. So we found about 300 species of vegetables, nutrition data, looking at the nutrients that humanity is most in need of. So like about 2 billion people have traditional malnutrition and are missing certain things and, and, and an unknown number of hundreds of millions or more people are, have this set of industrial diet deficiencies. People who live in the United States and eat McDonald's a lot and don't get a lot of vegetables are missing a different set of nutrients. So right. we look at those nutrients that an awful lot of people are missing in their diets to see how these vegetables would do to meet those needs. And the class of vegetables, which was the best at providing those nutrients is trees with edible leaves. Yeah. So not only are there way more of them than I ever thought there would be, and not only do they sequester carbon and are low maintenance and everything else, but also they are the best as a class. <laughs> a few of them are kind of mediocre, but generally speaking, they're the most powerful class of vegetables to meet the nutritional deficiencies that, you know, maybe three or 4 billion people mm. are affected by. So that seems like a very good reason to flesh them out. And also I just thought they were cool. So mm -hmm. I went for it and I was able to get a small grant from Trees for Climate Health, which is part of Jonas Philanthropies to, to write the book and then put it out for free, which has been a really great part of the process and we yeah. can talk later about translations we have a, we're working on three other languages right now for the book so that's awesome. super exciting cool. and because it's creative commons it's able to just get out there and mm -hmm. really make a rapid it's actually now it's been out since i think january sometime in january and now it's march mm -hmm. and already it's been downloaded twenty eight thousand times from my website and other people have it on there so who knows how many other versions are out there so that's really exciting that's wow that's what awesome. you want when you do something like this you want people Absolutely. to read it and because i didn't have to go through a publisher and all that it was able to just get edited and laid out and put right out which yeah is, you don't have really to go through all the paperwork and like the yeah the year-long process it takes a long time and you know i'm grateful to my publishers for putting my stuff out but yeah, i yeah. love this idea of somebody just pays me and then i can put it out for free that's really that's super exciting and also my patron my patreon patrons very much helped with that process and are continuing to help with the translation process which takes my time as well you know mm -hmm. so yeah. Are you What's translating your... them? The Spanish one, I did a fair amount, maybe about a quarter of the translating. And then I had a group of volunteers who did the rest. And we're done. So it's about to go to layout. And I have a volunteer who's willing to do the layout for free. For French, I don't 
speak. I don't read much French. I've read one book in French with a lot of help. And the, and the last, a group came forward from the Czech Republic who want to do it in Czech, who are very organized, super together permaculture world there. So that is just beginning now. So I would love to see lots more languages. If, if any of your listeners are, are interested in working on translation, either to those languages or, or, or want to bring forward some other ones. I'm thrilled I'll work with anybody who wants to, to move it forward in any other language. And we did in the book, I, because it's a global guide, I put the names for plants, for the plants in all of the world's 20 most commonly spoken languages, and also in the languages of the places where they are grown as vegetables. So really trying to put that layer of what do people call it? Right. Uh, yeah. In there, which is, you know, it's fun. That was fun to do. I had never really done that to that level before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super cool. And just, but usually we do this at the end, but what is your website and Patreon in case folks who are listening are sure. like, yes, I want to get in touch with you right now. Sure. Okay. If they want to download the book, they can go to perennialagriculture.institute and go to the blog. It's right in there. And the other languages will be there as well. I'm sort of reinvigorating perennialsolutions.org as my general website where like events and stuff will be. And on Patreon, I'm Eric Tonsmeyer. And people will be very welcome to, to help me out with that. It's been quite delightful to get support from people on the, on the writing. It's enabled us to do like we have about to come out an analysis of the native perennial vegetables of Mexico. Ooh. With, I don't know, 500 species or something. Wow, cool. They're amazing. Mexico, and I'm working with a bunch of folks in Mexico on it. So the Patreon just enables these things to happen that nobody would care about otherwise. <laughs> and just grease the skids and make things happen faster. So Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like a lot of people care yeah. about, you know, that 28,000 downloads. That's a lot. Yeah. And it, I think it's a very important niche, you know, it's an important sub subject to talk about because like, as you, as you were saying, like they take a lot less maintenance, they help with erosion, they sequester carbon, and apparently they also have more nutrition. So is that because they're like, they have deeper roots and they can get more minerals or do you know why? I'm, I speculate that that's why. I don't know. I mean, if you imagine the root system of like a spinach plant versus a tree, there's really the tree's going to win every time, probably. Right. But there are a few trees with edible leaves that are not impressive in their nutrition. So it's not like all of them are. And there are a few annuals that are very impressive, like amaranths, jute leaf, the quail grass, which is a celosia, which is a really nice one. And uh, the other one that was a real stand. Oh, the other real standout was spider plant, African spider plant. Hmm. Spinach has like the highest folate of anything, of any plant, of any leaf, you know, vegetable anywhere. So it's not always, but it's a, the nutrition thing is, is shockingly tilted towards the trees with that beliefs. And I do provide nutrition for the species in the book. And one of the things that made it possible to write this as a global book is that even though they are from all over the world and all different climates, you manage them the same everywhere. They're all managed with intense pruning or 99% of them are managed with intense pruning, coppicing or lopping okay. or pollarding. So you cut it back really hard, mm -hmm. close to the ground, or if you have livestock around, maybe above the reach of livestock. Mm -hmm. And that does a couple of things. One is that as they re-sprout really vigorously, it means the leaves are tender for longer. So like a, just a regular linden tree, let's say, which you all would have out where you are for yeah. sure, you can eat for like two weeks in the spring and then it's too tough. Uh -huh. yeah. But if it's coppiced or they'll often, lindens will often have those shoots at the base. Yeah. yeah. Those will keep going on into September. Uh huh. So you're talking about extending the season from a couple of weeks to multiple months. I, I was in Reno, Nevada, and there was a mulberry that had been coppiced that was still tender and good to eat in October. Wow. Wow. From, you know, May or something. So you're, you have this huge season extension with the long, tender, tender growth. I find that my other perennial vegetables are done by the end of June. Yeah. yeah. These help you get through the summer until the tender stuff comes back and fall. And in, in places 
in the tropics with the dry season, they'll often go way out into the dry season. So that ex that season extension is really important. They also, it just makes them so easy to manage. You just cutting it and pruning it and that's it and harvesting. So you're not bending, you're not lifting, you're not digging once they're established. In fact, I had a, I, I met a guy at a conference once who told me that he loved the perennial vegetables book because he, he ran a, an, a gardening program in Mozambique for people with HIV who were ill and they needed super nutritious leaves and they needed to, and they loved the trees with edible leaves because they didn't have to bend, they didn't have to dig, they could just, they were so easy to be cared for when you're ill. And that's, I think, a good standard for any of us to, then you add the, the non-tillage and everything else. Yeah, right, yeah. It's, it's a pretty, they're great. I, I would never live without them again. I have about 12 of those tuna trees ready to go out here from root cuttings and um really excited to try a bunch of other new things out here I haven't had yet. And so how do you eat them? Is it just like fresh munching? Or are you making it into a stir fry? It varies from species to species. Some you can eat raw. A lot of them need to be cooked. So let's see, linden, I'll eat, I'll, I'll eat all of mine raw. That would be like goji, tuna, linden, and even I'll eat a little bit of mulberry raw, but it's just not that great. I'm more, yeah. so I'll nibble on them when I'm out in the garden. I'm yeah. more likely to eat, to cook them in soups, in stir fries, tatas, fried rice, kind of whatever I'm cooking and whatever I would put other greens in. Gotcha. But there are some species that are really very nice to eat raw, particularly in the tropics. You can just have in a salad or something. Linden is probably the closest we have to that. And I would say it is pretty slimy for my taste. Although in many parts of the world, that's what you want. Right. I mean, it is medicinal too. It's, demul you know, demulcent mm -hmm. it has the mucilage, so mm -hmm. it can be helpful. But would you eat a huge bowl of it? <laughs> for me, the answer is no. But again, that's really different from place to place around the world. So I didn't try and judge these plants. Some of them are so bitter, I couldn't eat them. And yet people grow them and eat them. And that was the filter we used for this book is things people grow for their edible leaves, not just plants with edible, trees with edible leaves, which there are hundreds more of, but just the, just the ones people grow. And I might make different choices if it was me in any given part of the world, but it's not about what choice I would make. This is just reporting on what people are growing. Yeah, so I think that's an important point. All the species in here are ones that, I'm sorry, our dog is. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, Hi, doggy. So all these species are ones that are, are cultivated and sold in markets and so on. Like they're, they're actual major crops in the parts of the world that they are grown in, which is, is because it, when I was looking at this book, I was seeing a lot of like all of the northern hemisphere, like climate plants. There are American native corresponding plants, but they aren't cultivated. I mean, I, you know, I, I have an American base with basswood and I've got sassafras and, and so on, mm. but it's not like a cultural thing that people do and sell. Yeah. So could we talk a little bit about the, those Northern hardy plants? Cause we're in the North. There are a lot more in the, in the, in the tropics, but there are some good ones that we can grow up here. Right. There are lots. And I, and I think North, the, the U S and Canada was the only really big part of the world that didn't have any at all. So we have our work cut out. Mm, right. Well, I mean, there, there's also pretty, you know, there are, we, we know the plant, the, the trees that, that produce edible leaves, we just have to, to, to do We're it just and popularize it. Growing them and selecting yeah. the right varieties. And, and maybe that's something that was happening here before Europeans came and it was sort yeah. of, you know, truncated or whatever. Some of the ones that are around here that I, um, okay, well, actually one of the big ones is Aurelia spinosa. Yes, yes. Which is almost exactly the same as, yeah. as a lot of, which is grown in a huge way. I actually translated a book from Korea, from South Korea which is like a hundred page manual on growing that species, growing their wow, species. And cool. I would imagine all the same practices would work here. It's horribly spiny, but they love it. It's 
like a big they like grow it in greenhouses to force it early in spring and stuff it's oh, a major okay um cool. so that would be one beach our american beach which is really mm -hmm. sour and tender and nice for like a week but i haven't tried coppicing it to see how long it'll go so that's something right. i'll try i found that basswood is a little more fuzzy than the other lindens mm -hmm. Maybe maybe some forms are better than others, or maybe that's good for certain kinds of cooking projects. I know people like some of the birches. I haven't started experimenting with birches yet. Out west, we have the native salt bushes, like four wing salt bush, which is super cold hardy. Our native cacti, including we have a native cactus here in Massachusetts. Prickly pear. Yeah, but it's you have to peel off the right. yeah everything pretty carefully then yeah. i don't know what are some other ones you folks have been thinking about you mentioned some others too well in the book you mentioned a an asian um what is it lantern <laughs> bladder nut an asian bladder, bladder nut yeah and we do have a bladder nuts i think there are several species native to different yeah. parts of the usa but we have some in the, in the east and i know you can eat the seeds as a nut but i had never heard of you using the leaves so i don't know if people just haven't done that before or if it's not something that you should do I don't know. or if it's deadly poisonous right who knows <laughs> well, it's probably not poisonous but it, you know yeah, i haven't it seen easy. any reference to its edibility but i may experiment cautiously mm -hmm. with it i'm growing some of those other ones the asian ones out now they're like cold stratifying in my greenhouse from I see. So i'm hoping to know another one i really like is the shoots of sumac the peeled shoots of sumac oh. are pretty good okay cool. when they're like about you know two feet long or a foot and a half long or something you can break it off and peel it yeah and they're sort of it's more like a stem vegetable it's like a crunchy sweet crunchy so sweet you, and sour peel the bark off and eat the rest like asparagus kind of yeah awesome that's yeah, good that's, to know because sumac is abundant it's we'll around we'll it's say around. and i wouldn't maybe plant it for that no but don't plant it if no, it's, it's there, around you might as well eat it this and that's of... probably a good way to manage it i always think about that with these like very aggressive species like oh if we incorporated it into our diet more than you know yeah. as like a staple food then it wouldn't maybe be so problematic I'll keep it under control yeah, yeah so that's a really good tip thank yeah. you some of the maples, I know some people oh. eat some of them, but some of them are very poisonous to horses. Hmm. There's like a whole syndrome of red maple poisoning for horses. So I would only follow in the steps of people you trust on, 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 the, on the maples. Although I know you can eat the Japanese maples, the ornamental Japanese hmm. maples, and hmm. they're quite good. They're very sour and they're beautiful in a salad hmm. that like red, you know, yes. cannabis looking leaves and stuff. Yeah, are really nice. cool. um, and maybe cool. with coppicing, those might produce for a longer season too, yeah. right? I don't, red bud leaves <clears> you can eat. They're not that great. I love the flowers, I'm not wild yeah. about the leaves. Some of the elms. Hmm. I just haven't systematically sampled all these things yet. Yeah. Well, there is sassafras, and sassafras does have a cultural use. I mean, you make gumbo with it, but there's a yeah. name for the... Filet. Filet, yeah. Filet powder. Yeah, yeah. So it, does, it is used, but it's not necessarily used as a... It's more of a spice than a vegetable, I guess. <laughs> thickener, I think. Thickener, so. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, get, we get... We work with what we have available to us, right? And, and there are some great things from mostly from Asia that will grow here very well that are spectacular vegetables. So I've mostly been leaning into those. But now that I have more land to play with, I'll get more of the native trees with edible leaves in. I do grow lots and lots and lots of useful native food plants, and I really think that's important. But in this particular area, I haven't ever had enough room to play with that until so now. So can I ask, as you're, as you're in, in your, like, first season, right, of this new property, like what are some of your major players as far as the plants that you want to plant? Like, what are you thinking about? Like, I need to get in my garden. Sure. Well, okay. The backfield, we were here last year, but that was mostly like cover cropping and site prep and stuff, mm -hmm. greenhouse repair. The backfield is going into a perennial staple crop agroforestry system. Ooh. So all the kinds of nuts I've always wanted to grow and didn't mm. have enough room for. Seaberry, which is really high mm. in oil. Yes. 
um, and then rows of crops in between those. And then in the front, we're doing small fruits this year. So all kinds of berries and grapes and kiwis, asparagus. And then next year, there'll be a more of like a tree fruit orchard kind of a thing. And, and for decades to come, we'll just keep adding more. I mean, every year we'll keep adding more stuff. Yeah. I am excited to, I'm growing out a bunch of hardy tea from seed, hardy green tea. Nice. Oh. The subspecies, it's Camellia sinensis, sinensis, the subspecies uh-huh. sinensis is supposedly hardy, at least in zone six. So I've got a hundred or so seeds of that I'm growing out to see, cause that would be really cool. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And, and, and lots of we're on really sandy acid soil, so I'm just really doing a deep dive into the useful native plants for sandy acid soil. What are the nitrogen fixing plants? What are the beneficial insect plants? What are what's every possible edible plant mm. for that? Those kind of conditions, really dry, really sandy, really degraded, horribly degraded. Yeah. So there's work. There's work to be done. I mean, last year was watermelons and cherry tomatoes Ooh. and ground cherries is kind of the annual fruits we can grow that I, mm-hmm. that I like to eat. So yeah, more annuals in the earlier years and we'll phase that out more over, over time, but. Very cool. Yep. That's yeah. Ground, sort of ground cherries are just such a golden nugget of deliciousness. I love them so much. They're so underappreciated. We have yeah. a bunch of native perennial ones and I have a nice, nice. perennial one from New Zealand that is really good. The other thing is nitrogen fixing plants, which we really need here. So we're like yeah. leaning in on the herbaceous legumes. And then mm-hmm. um, one of our native nitrogen fixers, Amorpha fruticosa, which I'm really yeah. super into. Yeah. Uh, I'm growing out a bunch of Albizia julibris and the, the silk tree mimosa mm-hmm. from yes. seed. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, it's a great medicine too. Oh, that's, yeah, it's one of my favorite grief and food uplifting medicines. It's just, Uh it's almost like a hard drug. It's like, it can be jarring how effective it is. Like if you're in grief and you take some mimosa flower, you're like, why do I feel as good? Like this isn't right, you know? It's beautiful too. It'll lift your spirit. Just looking at the thing. It is. It It reminds me of a Dr. Seuss plant, you know, like the little puff balls. That is absolutely (laughs) what I, what I think. Yeah. And then it, (laughs) It, it fixes nitrogen and it has all these traits for, for agroforestry. It has a really light canopy. So it lets a lot of light through. doesn't yeah. shade much. It leaves okay. out really late in the spring and drops leaves early in the fall. So for combining with cool season crops, it mm-hmm. doesn't compete as much for light with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can prune it as hard as you want and it'll come back. It is listed as having edible leaves, but when I've had them, they've been so bitter. I couldn't oh, you got, spit them out. I, I couldn't do it at all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I've seen people eat the leaves, eat the flowers too mm-hmm. on videos, but I have mine. Mine are only two inches tall, so they're not flowering oh, yeah. just yet. Just not, not quite yet. Yeah. Not quite yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I put them in honey. So I've eaten them too. I put them in honey and then just add them right whole to my tea and it's lovely. Mm. Oh, that's great. And they are the 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 ruby throated hummingbirds number one favorite yes. pollinator plant oh yay so what's not to love i mean they're weedy but not not here not yet anyway mm-hmm. so yeah uh, and if i prune them enough they won't they won't set for the seeds are very poisonous i think they're known to to poison livestock the pods mm. yeah so that's one thing to to think about with them i actually also had another i I had another question about livestock. Like if you're, when you were saying like, you know, you can use coppicing and pollarding that's above the level of the livestock, you know, if you're eating it for yourself, but like, what about feeding it to livestock, feeding these leaves to livestock and then eating the meat? Are you finding, do you know anything about that? If it's like way more nutrient dense than the meat? I'm, I'm actually writing another whole book about that. Really? Okay. Systems around the world and how they might apply in the U S and what are the species we might use and what, what their nutritional value is to livestock. They track the digestibility and the protein, especially are two things I'm really looking at. And of all the temperate species we're listing here in this book, you could feed any of them to livestock, but there are other things that they love to eat that we don't eat so much like willows and poplars and stuff. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. But yeah, there are systems where you would cut the leaves and drop them down to them, like cut branches and drop them down. But there are mm-hmm. also systems where they 
directly browse those plants you like coppice them low and they come into the field and they browse it all down and then you rotate them onto another paddock and those systems are very productive in other parts of the world and essentially unexplored here in any significant way and really worth figuring out the the one that i think that's being done with now here is bush clover lespediza bicolor mm -hmm which is a pretty horrible weed, but it is it is being sown in, in, in pastures as a, like a warm season legume for the Southeast. Uh -huh. And it grows here real well too. So, and that has edible leaves for people, just huh. about as good as a white clover leaf, which is to say not great, <laughs> but, but edible, yeah. you know? So yeah, I'm definitely looking at, the, and mostly the techniques for humans and livestock are exactly the same. The only difference is, okay. They will chew on the bark of the tree and kill it if you leave them in there too long. And we don't tend to do that. Yeah. And they can browse the leaves directly, whereas we mostly don't do that. And they'll eat them less tender than we will as well. Right. They're a lot less picky. And the big bonus there is, again, the seasonal thing where in the Northeast, grass dries out in the summer. Mm-hmm. Like last summer, you could see fields that was, grass was all brown and there are trees in the middle that are green. Right. Mm. That's when you want the tree fodders in the middle of the summer when it's green to to make up for those shortages. In other places, people use warm season pastures more, but there you can use the tree leaves as a protein supplement because warm season grasses are lower in protein, generally speaking, than cool season grasses. So there are all these like different types of complementarity between the different forages and stuff and between mm -hmm. trees and herbaceous plants that I'm starting to understand better, which is really fun and interesting. I mean, I've been looking at that for a long time, but I'm, I'm learning a lot more about. Cool. That's exciting. Like a cool season understory with a tree is with a deciduous tree is a great combination. Yeah. 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 Especially if it's fixing nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's one thing that I was interested in too, was when you're talking about the tree species across the world and the families that they belong to, a high number of them are legumes. And so I know legumes are, you know, that they fix nitrogen. They generally, because of that, probably have more protein, but they also have on average more alkaloids and they can be more poisonous. So I was a little surprised that there, there are so many of them that are, that the leaves are eaten. Um, but so is that are they specially selected ones that have less poisons or are they just like a lot of legumes without those alkaloids? Well, I was surprised to see that too. Like the erythrinas, especially some of those are like the seeds of some of those are really deadly poisonous. So, I mean, I guess it's a really big family. So there are some members that are not poisonous, yeah, but I, I don't so. think of us really eating a lot of leaves from that family in this climate although i eat cow pea greens a lot and i love pea greens mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so i guess it's just there's a few that you can eat and to my knowledge those the 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 legumes legume trees that are grown for their edible leaves are mostly not really selected individual forms Okay. So it's kind of, you just plant the species. I'm, it may be that there are improved varieties, but mostly they're just kind of random. Whereas in some other things, there are very particular forms that have been selected, like chayas that don't sting. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, when you touch it, you get stung. You definitely mm -hmm. don't want that one. Kind of like how we have some relatively low stinging nettles. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Same kind of that some people have selected, same sort of thing there. Yeah, I, I was a little surprised to see that too. And then a lot of the euphorbia family, mm -hmm. which I think of as super poisonous. Right. And indeed, some of them have cyanide and you have to cook them for a while before you can eat them. Uh -huh. So yeah, I was surprised to see those families so highly represented. I wasn't surprised to see the mulberry family. Right. A lot of members of that. I wasn't surprised to see the mallow family. Yeah. 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 The new expanded mallow family, which where Linden lives, but there's tons of those. And then if you were to add the non-cultivated species, that group gets way bigger too. There's just a whole lot of those. Same with the mulberry family. There's so many that are eaten, if not cultivated. So it's the, it was fun to look at the sort of taxonomic relationships and what genera were especially represented and stuff. That's I enjoy those kinds of things. Yeah. 
So, so what were like the standouts? What were like the the best all across the world, all across the zones? What are like the best tree crops ever for edible, for edible leaves? Well, I think I mean chaya is amazing because it's really easy to grow and it's incredibly nutritious. Edible leaf mulberry is phenomenal. It's it's like people love to talk about moringa and how nutritious it is, and it absolutely is. But mulberry and chaya and a number of other crops are right up there with with moringa at that level of sort of out, outstanding phenomenal nutrition. I love the Chinese tune. Not only is it super nutritious and it will grow here, but it really tastes like chicken soup, which is <laughs> what <cool>. pretty <laughs> incredible. It really <laughs> tastes like chicken soup. And that's just at first, I didn't quite know what to do with that. And now <laughs> I'm I'm planting a dozen of them here this uh -huh. year because I oh. just have to have, I have to have so much more of it because I love <laughs> it so much. Um, nice. There's a bunch of figs. I think that was the largest genus, ficus. So many different kinds of figs. One of which this major plant geek in Florida says is the world's most delicious leaf crop of all of the world's leaf crops. So I mm. really want to try that one. There's one that jumped out called Ofenga. It's it's an ornamental, like a hedge plant that's grown in the tropics widely, but in the Solomon Islands where it's from, it's an important vegetable and it's really nutritious. And it's one, uh, there's a lot of these things where plants are, are well distributed, but no one knows you can eat them outside of their homeland. Right. So Ofenga is one of those, some of the Bauhinias are in that category as well yeah those would be some of the ones that really leap out i mean no cactus is is very very widely grown and super easy to grow where you know that's a pretty great one one of the more important ones the moringas certainly are are you know and interestingly the the the, the most commonly grown moringa moringa oleifera in india and pakistan where it's from they eat it for the pods they grow it for the pods not for the leaves Everywhere else, we're eating it for the leaves, but they're like, those leaves don't taste that good. We eat the pods. Thank you very much. And then there's a couple which are almost extinct in the wild, but still grown like African Moringa, which is Moringa stenopatala, which is arguably better leaves than Moringa oleifera because the leaflets are so much bigger and easier to harvest. Chaya is 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 very hard to find in a lot of its native region. And like in Guatemala, it's very hard to find in gardens, but a super fantastic crop. And cassava leaf is another one that's outstanding nutrition. People are already growing cassava everywhere they can. So you can just leave it in the ground for a decade and keep harvesting the leaves, just cook it for the, for the cyanide. Right. And one I'm excited to try here, I don't know if it's outstanding or not yet really, but they grow it in South Korea and China is Calopanax septum lobus which I think is quite, has a reputation for being kind of invasive here. So I'm gonna, I'm growing it with care. I'll be coppicing it every year and stuff and not letting it go to seed, but apparently mild flavor and very productive. And I have all this good data on the growing systems. I, that was the other half of the manual I translated from Korean is, was on that species and pretty seriously grown in South Korea. So I have to think that means it's worth us playing around with here. So yeah, tried cuttings on a friend's tree for a few years, couldn't get them to work. So now I'm cold stratifying the seed and just doing it the old fashioned way. <laughs> so yeah. See how it goes. Yeah. Cool. So to go back to one of those, the mulberry, so that is in around here, you know, in, in the U S we have like three different species, black, white, and red. What of those do you use? And I feel like people know about mulberries, but not very many people know about mulberry leaves. Sure. I recently learned that what we call Morris alba is actually a complex of like six or seven different species. Nice. <laughs> so, but all of those people eat and people also eat Morris nigra and Morris rubra as well. So none of them will make you sick. With that said, they don't all taste good. So there's a couple issues. One is just the flavor. Another is the, a lot of them have a texture, almost like, like blue jeans, like very textile -y, way too fibrous, even when they're young and tender. And, 
and all the red mulberries I've ever been around have sandpapery texture on the leaves, which is not what I'm looking for in a vegetable, although those have been eaten for sure. So I think it's a matter of just going around with the wild trees around you, with the cultivated trees, sampling the leaves and bringing the right cultivars into into cultivation and starting to name some varieties. There's a new one, a friend of mine named in Florida, just called Edible Leaf Mulberry. Mm. There's one in Mexico called Tigrinum. I found Illinois Everbearing is okay, but not great. Mm -hmm. And we've been, oh, there's there's this one really North Hardy variety that they grow in, in Vermont, which was pretty good. I can't remember, Northrop, I think maybe, I can't remember the name. So I've, one year I bought a bunch of seedlings like bare root seedlings and selected out the best couple of varieties from that. I think it's just a matter of somebody going around and trying a bunch. Ideally, some varieties that are already commercially available are good and then that are already in the trade. So you can just say, oh, get such and such a variety and you'll know. Mostly the fruiting varieties I've sampled have not been great, except one that was called white, which could be anything and there's a hundred varieties called that so that wasn't super super helpful but i don't have like 20 varieties of mulberry so i have been mostly just going around the wild ones around my neighborhood and sampling those i think our best mulberries are yet to come here in china there's a variety collection of a couple of hundred fodder varieties that are grown for silkworms so to me that would be the perfect place to start is in a collection like that that are already selected for leaf quality and tenderness, but I'm not planning on heading to the Chinese mulberry cultivar collection anytime soon. So in the meantime, it's just, I think, sampling and then starting to get things out there. Unfortunately, I found that grafting is the best way to propagate temperate mulberries. Some of the, some, a few varieties here will grow from live stakes or from cuttings like that. But it's not a super it's not super easy, I think, from cuttings. I don't know if you all have had good, better experience with that. I haven't had good experience. I've had good experience grafting, but not no, yeah. no, no cuttings have taken. So I haven't tried that much. Though, yeah, my buddy Jonathan has had good luck. Jonathan Bates has had okay luck with dormant cuttings. Uh -huh. Okay, like over the winter, he'll cut them in the fall, and he'll bury them in the dirt over the winter in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And then some of those will sprout in the spring. Nice. Uh, but I think that's one of the key things holding it back. We have to find the right varieties and then we have to multiply those varieties. Yeah. And there are some that will grow really easily. And I wonder if that's because there are so many species uh -huh. hiding under Morris Alba. And maybe that some of those are easier to propagate vegetatively than others. I, I don't know. And I can't tell them apart. Looking at the descriptions of them, I'm like, that's out of my, above my pay grade, telling those things apart. Our level but bottom there, but they'll grow everywhere. Yeah. You know, from, from like Southern Canada to the tropics and they're really hard to kill and they grow really fast and they're very productive. Those are all things in, in favor of mulberries. It's just a matter of finding ones that don't taste bad or have a bad texture that is between us and it becoming, and really you couldn't, there isn't a better, more nutritious vegetable in the world. Let's just see if I have my printout of the book handy here. Let's see. Okay, I'm just gonna quote on the nutrition of mulberry here for a moment because they're so extraordinary. Yep. Let's see. I don't. Okay. So it's in the top ten of all the world's vegetables for the following nutrients: calcium, iron, folate, and vitamin C. And then paired to the vegetables that you could ever buy in a store, it is more than twice as high in calcium and iron. It is higher than any of those stores you'd ever vegetables you'd ever find in the store in fiber, magnesium, zinc, folate, and vitamin C. And it's equally high in vitamin A. I mean, that's stunning. It's just an incredibly nutritious vegetable. But unless it, we get the varieties that taste good, we won't eat that much of it. So, yeah, or maybe I'm thinking of like ways to eat the really nutrient dense leaves like that. And, you know, 
how to make it accessible for the masses to like want to eat it. And I'm thinking about like pesto and like mixed green soup, how we make like a nettle potato soup. Totally, totally. And I'm wondering if you've had, if you found any success in marketing for lack of a better word or like, you know, just pop, yeah, that's yeah. a better word. Popularizing these edible leaves with people who maybe are more likely to go get like fast food and aren't really eating vegetables much anyway. Do you have any, you know? Sure, sure. Well, that? first I'll say that in China, powdered mulberry leaves are added to lots of baked goods. Awesome. Okay. So it's a very okay. common thing. I think like leftovers that silkworms didn't want or something maybe, but whatever it is. Like a part of the cuisine there, you get like bread, green bread that has mulberry powder in it. No way. Okay. So the the person who's done a lot of that kind of stuff is David Kennedy, who wrote the Leaf for Life books and has an organization called Leaf for Life. He has a lot of different recipes for ways to integrate greens into pasta and cookies and baked goods and things like that. What I will do here, like on our volunteer days and stuff over the years, is I just boil it and have people try it and see what they like and you know dip it in a nice little sauce or something maybe uh -huh. and that's been enough for some things to get like mulberry shoots people and mulberry I'm, I'm sorry milkweed broccoli and milkweed shoots are like always a hundred percent hit when we do yeah. that yeah. um people are not as wild about mulberry because i they think it's fine so if yeah. you mix it in with what you're cooking, it's mm -hmm. fine. It's not <laughs> spectacular, you know. But again, I think that's just a, a variety waiting. The right variety is waiting to to come along. The fragrant spring tree, the Chinese tune, seems to sell itself pretty well because the the chicken flavor is so interesting to people. Yeah. Um, I think it has a lot of potential for vegans. Mm, yeah. for plant-based dishes i think you could put that in a plant-based chicken soup mm -hmm. yeah some chicken in the woods and some tune and yeah gotta... yeah you would really be a hundred percent of the way there um, <laughs> so and linden where this isn't a part of the world where people are looking for thick thickeners yeah. you know for slimy things to stick thick in their soup so much but where people like okra mm -hmm. i think wow. it would be an easy you know easy sell the yeah i mean edible leaf goji i love but people think it's i mostly people think they're fine in soup is what i found with the ones that grow here i my my friend erica who helped to work on the research for the book she traveled all over erica klopf traveled all over botanic gardens all over south florida getting samples to eat and also getting cuttings so she's building out a nursery with like 40 nice. or 50 species of of tropical delights and she works very closely with chefs there okay. to do sort of like special tasting events and stuff where people will try some of these interesting crops. And I think that's what it would take here is finding the right chef who uh, I'm working actually with Neftali Duran, who's a chef out here on some of these things. We'll be doing some events here at the farm over the years to come where we'll basically cook up whatever's around on the farm that day, you know? So I think it's finding the right chef who wants to try things and i and i feel like the nutrition angle should be a yeah. huge draw for chefs who want to try something new i mean what a story to tell that's to me people would go for that but it can be hard to get people even to just eat like lettuce and kale and stuff too so <laughs> yeah i guess that's true um, i think you're I, you're on to something with the powders because that's something that's really easy that you can like literally just sprinkle onto your cereal or oatmeal or put in a smoothie. And it it's like you were saying about the nutrient dense profile, like it does kind of sell itself in that way where people are really lacking in, in minerals. And if they can take a powder rather than like capsules that are super expensive and it, I think that's a, a really good angle as well as getting the chefs on board. Like that's really exciting to to think about like a professional, amazing chef working with these yeah. plants, you know? They're always looking for new stuff. They the are. powder thing is interesting. Moringa, I think is the world's most widely grown tree leaf today. Mm -hmm. There's like a million and a half acres of Moringa being grown around the world, according to one thing I read, but almost all that is powdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People aren't, you don't go to your gas station and buy fresh moringa leaves, but you can buy a moringa powder. Mm -hmm. So that is one way to go. There's another process called leaf protein concentrate, mm 
Hmm. where you basically make cheese or tofu out of leaves. Oh my gosh. You juice them and then you simmer the juice just for a moment and the protein coagulates out. And then you run that through a cheesecloth or a, like a, whatever, a nut milk, whatever, you know, some kind of filter Mm -hmm. and you get this green sort of cake out of it, which is usually tastes like wheatgrass juice in my Mm -hmm. experience. It's very Mm -hmm. strong. So you mix that with stuff and it's about on a dry weight basis, it's like 50% protein and it has all the minerals and vitamins that are in the leaves. It basically gets rid of the fiber and the water, Uh which are what keep us from being able to live on eating only leaves the fiber is the reason like cows can digest the fiber we basically can't that's why we can't eat grass Mm -hmm. so this enables us to eat grass it enables us to eat clover poplar leaves all kinds of things some things don't work well like mulberry apparently doesn't work well i've had good luck with that bush clover Mm -hmm. so it remains to be seen which of these you can make leaf protein concentrate from then that can be mixed with hummus it can be mixed with avocado to make amazing bright green guacamole you can bake it in things you can mix it with tortillas to make green tortillas oh cool so that the the issue is we're not nobody is doing that commercially anywhere in the world yet leaf protein concentrate there's one facility in france that makes it from alfalfa but that would be to me that's would really take these trees to the next level as a staple protein source and actually there's even more protein per acre from leaf protein concentrate than from soybeans ah it's like the very most protein you can get from an acre Uh and and that i learned that's because the when plants are putting protein into seeds like beans which we think of as the most protein we can get from an acre Mm -hmm. they leave some of the protein behind in the leaves and the roots but if you're eating the leaf if you're extracting it from the leaves themselves you're getting like the very most protein you can get so in terms of climate change it's like the the best kind of protein you can have, even though the holistic raising people might come after me for that. In terms of the question of how many square feet does it take to make your protein, you can't be leaf protein concentrate. Right. It doesn't taste as good as grass fed beef or grass fed yeah. dairy for sure. And I'm not ready to leave those things behind. But if we could shift to that for livestock feed, at least like for our pigs and chickens, they don't care how it tastes, you know. And yeah. I have found I worked with a chef in, in, in Montreal, Jeremiah Bullied about with this, and he was make he found that making it from pea greens was the tastiest. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot left to do with learn. I want to really do here on the farm at a big scale, this leaf protein concentrate, like uh-huh. have an acre of grass between my trees that is just for cutting and making into leaf protein concentrate. Wow. And I want to do workshops on making it here and stuff. I need to figure out how to move from a juicer which is so slow of a way to right. do it yeah. to you know like a rotary screw press or something that mm-hmm. can really you know make it happen like i need an industrial scale juicer of some kind yeah well i i guess you could do so, the sort like making juice like making apple cider you know you grind it and then you put it through the press that could work Huh. There's got to be some yeah. equipment out there already that yeah. people use that I can like. What does a giant wheatgrass juice operation use? Yeah, you can just use that. Mm-hmm. So that would be sort of taking these from the realm of a vegetable to being a staple. Yeah, food. And right now we're just beginning with vegetable in this country. So that's I feel like the home garden is the right next step for most parts of the world for most of these trees. Mm-hmm. But then from there, we can move to the market garden. And then from there, we can move to the, you know, powder, Mm -hmm. wholesale powder production. And then I think maybe there is room for the leaf protein concentrate for some of these things. Although, honestly, grass and clover works pretty well for leaf protein concentrate, too, and is easy enough to grow. In some cases, they would just harvest hay and make the concentrate from that. But the issue there is you don't want anything poisonous in the mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would rather work with, you know, really knowing what I'm putting in the, 
in the juicer before I'm concentrating it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it does sure. get rid of the leaf protein concentrate does get rid of the cyanide in crops like chaya and cassava mm -hmm. leaf. So it doesn't necessarily concentrate toxins. It eliminates some of them, but I would just really be hundred percent sure Drinking juice of some things has been poisonous to people like Katuk, which is one of the species, tropical species that I write, I write about in the book. Somebody died in Japan from drinking nothing but the juice of the leaves of that for weeks. Wow. Okay. Well, you probably shouldn't drink nothing but the juice of one plant right. for weeks. Yeah. For anything, yeah. maybe, you know, any number of things could be poisonous if you had that much like beets, the, cal right. the, the oxalates in there would be bad for you, right? Or whatever. So yeah. caution and moderation, I think, in all and diversity in the diet is kind of the way to to do that in all likelihood. Like they say at Echo, the, the, the place I've worked with in Florida on these things, they say, eat like a deer, not like a cow. Mm. have a lot of a little bit of everything although in fact cows when given the opportunity will also oh yeah right, will will enjoy a more diverse diet when they, <laughs> they get a chance cool have you done any research on elder leaves for oh. food here's what's oh, interesting this. they do have some cyanide in them mm -hmm. in south america elderberry is one of the most important fodder plants for livestock huh. very widely consumed and raw right off the tree. Mm. So cyanide is usually at its worst when not when a plant is fresh and not when it's dry, but when it's like wilted in between. Oh. So it might be that by eating it fresh, they're okay. getting around that. And the folks at the University of Missouri are working on understanding the toxicity of elderberry for livestock. Yeah. Uh, of elderberry leaf for livestock. And my first step would be to find out what they learn about that before I would think about it for people. But but it is <laughs> yeah. it is a really outstanding, it's incredibly digestible for livestock and um, really high in protein and being used. The, and then there's different species of elderberry. So which which species it is, some, some we know better than other. We don't actually know what species is being used for fodder in South America. It's either the the South American elderberry or European elderberry, which was also brought there or a hybrid. Nobody okay. knows. So but it's we're, a black fruited one. It is a black fruited one. Yes. Which is so unhelpful because so well, many. Yeah. Are. <laughs> well, I mean, generally like there's the, yeah, the red elderberry and the blue elderberry. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the black, yes. You know, it's and definitely it, not those. Although the blue elderberry is considered very good fodder as well, except okay. again for the cyanide, which occasionally kills a sheep. Right. So these are things we're trying to figure out for that other book is how do you yeah. safely consume something with cyanide, given that it is being done on a huge scale. Clearly, there's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. But you want to just be careful. But that would be a great candidate to investigate with caution. Yes, yeah. I think so. Meanwhile, poplars grow real well and make make safe, healthy leaf protein concentrate. So poplars mm. are growing here. I have three different species on the land that were here when we got here. So I'll be working on playing around with those. It's the, the big tooth aspen, mm -hmm. quaking aspen, and then there's, and cottonwood mm -hmm. are all here. And all of those are great for leaf protein concentrate. I think well, people do eat the young leaves of some of those, but I have found they're awful. Like papery, like the texture. Or... Fibrous and bitter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the buds yeah. from, from cottonwood and some other, are used medicinally mm -hmm. right for the resin though so i imagine that resin wouldn't be so good to, to, to eat and taste not it. impressed with what I <laughs> but again there's lots of species and varieties and hybrids out there but i would i would look they would be low on my list of trees to sample the leaves of let's put it that way smoke bush is another one smoke trees oh. another one people have sometimes eaten that oh, we also we eat spruce tips <laughs> oh yeah spruce tips but you wouldn't maybe eat a whole bowl of them yeah mm, no. i find they're like a nibble for me or for yeah. right. what do you like put a bunch of it in a soup that's sort of the question for me or larch right people do i've, I've done that with larch oh. too yeah sort of, okay I, I don't know about that about soup but yeah i like to nibble them or i'll put them in vinegar for salad honey. dressing or honey yeah. 
but yeah tea. as a vegetable but, yeah. yeah that's what we're really going for right when they're out in spring you're desperate to eat something green right exactly. it's yeah. the time they come at the perfect time and that's great but it's there's that line between like edible and taste bad edible and taste good in small amounts yeah would you grow this for food yeah <laughs> and that's a big and and that's a cultural i think mm -hmm. like yeah. there are definitely things in this book i would not eat as a vegetable myself ever and yet people do okay right so yeah. you know some people like strong flavors some parts of the world like in thailand they eat a lot of really really bitter leaves like neem leaves and stuff oh. That I think of as pesticide, right? Mm -hmm. But well, that they, probably also helps like deworm you. I'm sure it's very powerful. They yeah. they steam them and then they dip them in like a hot peanut sauce. Oh, yum! Probably anything tastes good. Dipped anything in. with peanut sauce, hundred <laughs> yeah, percent peanut sauce with lime juice in it. Come on. Mm -hmm. So and 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 there are places where food and medicine aren't really thought of as separate things yeah. so much. So that may be part of that tradition a little good more. Point. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, they're in there. There's a lot of this stuff back in European history that we don't, it, it, it didn't retain. So like, yeah. you know, like tree hay was common in, in Europe. And yeah. then like you, you have old rhymes about eating mugwort every spring and that's not a tree, but it's a bitter herb that you wouldn't necessarily think of eating, but you know, they say you should eat it in the spring to keep, to keep yourself healthy. Yeah. So, that Korean mugwort stood out as one of the most nutritious vegetables in the world, for sure. And yeah, I think it's a sort of, it's both a very old idea and a very new idea eating the leaves of trees, but it's definitely an idea that is here for us when we need it right now. Right. For the nutrition, for the climate, as climate change gets worse and it gets harder to farm and garden, these are resilient trees and, and, and you can use them in agroforestry systems that improve the resilience of your food production system. So it's a good time for us to be, they've just been waiting there for us to pay attention to them. I think, mm -hmm. right, as, as all the plants are, they're kind of like, well, mm -hmm. I'm ready for you to notice me when you <laughs> can pull your head out of your ignorance a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and I'm sure the best ones are yet to come too for our climate. I mean, I feel like I'm still every year I find something that I've been weeding out all this time that you can eat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so embarrassing. Like black nightshade. <laughs> yeah, black nightshade. Right. I eat the greens of that all the time. I love them, but for years we were we were weeding it out. Yeah. So how many more? I mean, cooked and not eating the young green fruits, which are super poisonous. Right. And not getting the wrong nightshade. Yeah. The, you know, white flowered, black fruited right. American nightshades are very good when you cook them, but not the unripe fruit, which can really mess you up. Yeah. And that's so important that the, the, the cultural practices too are so important and how you prepare them, you know, is you, you have to cook some for the cyanide. You have to, you know, you have to cook a lot of them. <laughs> but, yeah. I generally I, assume you should cook them unless... You specifically read you can eat it raw yeah. yeah and it's sort of a there's the the cultural part is the barrier here i mean okay we have these amazing perennial vegetables that grow on trees that are so cool what do we need to do to get people to eat them yeah as you yeah, were guess, as yeah. you were saying before and that's you know i don't understand why people don't i if i learn heard about a cool plant i would plant it and eat it right away but most people don't operate like that so um yeah. figuring out who the who the people are who have influence there you know i think getting people to start with as back as backyard crops is the right stage mostly here and maybe finding a few chefs who are wanting to try some crazy stuff i kind of feel like in the northeast us really most of the us that's probably where we outside of hawaii and south florida that's probably the right next step yeah, yeah. and then it'll get cool like pawpaws or ramps did you know mm -hmm. right which has been a slow process, slower than we would like. Yeah. Still too slow, but pawpaws have come a long way. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Pawpaws are doing great. Persimmons are coming up soon, hopefully. Oh, yeah. I love persimmons. I really think they're just the best, <laughs> the best thing we can grow, really, in some ways. You know, the best <laughs> yeah. We can grow. I love jujubes. I'm really excited about jujubes mm -hmm. right now. I never was, never thought much about them. Uh -huh. But I saw a bunch of them in Nevada that were taking 10 degrees below zero 
Wow. Getting less than 10 inches of rainfall and fruiting when they were 18 inches tall from seed. And I was wow. like, what is this? So then I, I tracked down the varieties that are short season, which is the issue for us. Mm, At least yeah. here is not so much hardiness because they're hardy in zone five, mm. but who will ripen fruit? Right. So I've, I, I tracked down a few short season varieties. We grew those at our old house. They did well. So here I'm going to plant all the short season varieties and start growing out the seeds. Yeah. We crosses of the short season varieties. It can handle, yeah. it doesn't care if it gets a frost in July. Mm. That's pretty nice. They <laughs> yeah. have three stages of ripening. So even if they don't ripen all the way, you can still eat them unripe and they're still good. They're incredibly drought tolerant. They just seem like a real climate resilient kind of fruit tree they do seem to need to be planted really close they're mostly pollinated by ants in my oh. garden so they want to be right next to each other the ants don't travel so far i suppose that's a good tip cool but i feel like jujubes really could be we're not doing everything we should with jujubes mm -hmm. yeah they don't have any sour in them and i like a little sour in a fruit but like a persimmon sweet is great too so mm -hmm. yeah yeah, it's yeah. got the spicy notes. Some the American persimmons have some oh, cinnamon or butter. Rich, deep, and yeah, yeah, and yes. rum kind of note in there too. Yeah. I think right? like rum and caramel and yeah. date and winter yes. squash or something. I don't know what it is, but they're yeah. <laughs> people are missing out if they're not growing that. I really feel like that's we'll we'll have room for a couple nice good good varieties here for that under real big. Fantastic. Yeah. So this has been an awesome discussion. I'm really, you know, really excited and happy that we got to talk. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to talk? Anything you're excited with, about yeah. coming up or? Well, let's see. Well, I already pitched all my places where people can find stuff. Let's see. We'll, put it in we'll be doing a bunch here. of workshops and stuff here on the site and we'll be doing a bunch of webinars too. Within the next year, well, next year, we'll have one, at least one new book coming out. I'm working with this group, Interlace Commons or an agroforestry group in Vermont. We'll have a, a manual on alley cropping for the temperate United States. Nice. Which I think is going to have stuff that's never all been in one place before. And then the tree fodder book will come not long after that. So that's, that's pretty exciting and fun. And uh, the next thing I'm working on writing with Erica again is on perennial brassica varieties. Mm. Sort of like an inventory of the world's perennial brassica varieties, which there's so many of. Mm. Very few of which will actually overwinter up here. And right experience but a few but I, i'm working on yeah we got sea kale <laughs> we got sea kale which is awesome sea kale is yeah. wonderful yeah great perennial vegetable so that's kind of this short list the the there was a group in vermont that did a bunch of work on sea kale where they calculated the yields and it actually by year three was yielding higher than asparagus per wow. acre for the for the broccolis for the little broccolis uh -huh. so i feel like that might be the next big perennial vegetable to move, yeah. you know, maybe ahead of the trees with edible leaves even. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Turkish yeah. rocket. Turkish rocket, I like. People think it's pretty weedy in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It, a little it has gotten weedy. It's a little more hairy it. and a little yeah. more strong flavored. Yeah. Not that that's bad, but some Dip, people don't like that. Dipped in well. some spicy limey peanuts. Oh yeah, peanuts. come on. Right? <laughs> but sea kale, like, it looks like something we, it looks like broccoli. Yeah, it exactly. Like broccoli. That's, you it know, could probably be an easier transition for annual vegetable producers to switch to key, sea kale than trees because they're used right. to. It's like growing asparagus yeah. or rhubarb or something. Right. And, and hiblitzi is another one that's kind yeah. of, you know, poised maybe grape leaves i think also would be mm -hmm. worth doing more with their they're like ridiculously high in vitamin a and stuff they're one of the world's best vegetables and i don't see anybody in the u.s doing much with i haven't seen personally us doing as much as we could with grape leaves yeah mostly sure. italian grandmothers mm -hmm. but right there yeah. is a, there is a cultural continuity of yeah. that yeah. yeah but a lot of people are buying them in cans and stuff yeah. and we could do more with them fresh. They use mulberry the same way, actually. Oh yeah, uh, I, I've I've tried that before. One of my friends made that one. Yeah, using really these things as wraps, I think, could be yep. another you know way to 
the big enough, the ones with big enough leaves, I think that's mm -hmm. another way to, to use them. So that's, that's probably pretty good. I appreciate y'all having me on and yeah, yeah this is pleasure to, to geek out with some serious plant people. Yeah. So, yes. I yeah. love plant people <laughs> yeah. for and, that reason. And, and I'm so glad, I just want to reiterate how amazing the work that you're doing is mm -hmm. because people just don't know about it and don't know how to do it. Like knowing how the, the, the management pro procedures are just the crucial bit there too, you know, and knowing what species to use, like making sure to cut them so you have the the tender leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you for good. writing this all down. It's my great pleasure. I do I do love doing it. And you know, how are you going to pick the leaves off a hundred foot tall tree, right? It just right. Mm -hmm. most of us are not going to go to that effort. There are people who do that around the world, but I would rather not be one of them. I'd rather just prune the thing myself. And awesome. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, yeah thanks. Eric. Thank you. Yeah.